Hello, everyone. This is Nanette Kennedy with Humanities Team and the Evolution Revolution. And happy Valentine's Day to all. Um, today, we are beginning a new book by Neil. The God Solution, The Power of Pure Love. And um, that's what we're going to do today is we're going to start that book. And um, Linda, you can take it away. Okay, I'm switching over to the phone um, so we have a better recording of me reading. Okay. I'm worried about my laptop connection. Well, as soon as I see that you need to get in the room, I'll. It says, it says I'm there. It says I'm there. It says I'm there. It says I'm there. Okay. 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 No, nope. okay. hang on. Nope. Something okay. wrong. There. Okay. Okay. Now we can get this without an audio, without an echo. So we are reading The God Solution, The Power of Pure Love. Um, that's the cover appropriate for uh, Valentine's Day. We didn't plan that that way, but it's nice it's worked out that way. So um, this book, for those of you that are not familiar with it, just came out, copyright is 2020, came out in December, and um, we will start part one, a new idea. Let's say for the sake of discussion that humanity could prove beyond a doubt that God exists. Do you think that would affect your life in any way? Would it make a difference as a practical matter? Let's say, for the sake of discussion, that humanity could prove beyond a doubt that God does not exist. Do you think that would affect your life in any way? Would it make a difference as a practical matter? A whole lot of people have explored those questions for a whole lot of time. Like, say, billions of people over thousands of years. I think that makes it fair to consider that questions about God are neither trivial nor irrelevant. Much depends on what is being said on this subject. If the Pope were to declare tomorrow, for instance, that he was wrong about everything and that there's no such thing as God, the emotional underpinnings of a huge swath of our species would be shaken to the core. If the spiritual leaders of all the other world religions were to say they agreed with him, the spiritual lives of eight-tenths of the human race would be in shambles. Surveys show that nearly 85% of the world's people identify with a religious group and believe in a controlling power. Yet, the world is a mess. So what difference does it make whether God exists or not? There comes a moment in every species development when timidity no longer serves, when more than the powerful or proverbial lone voice in the wilderness cries out to be heard, when it's fair question time. As a devastating global virus, as devastating radical injustice, and as devastating economic collapse assailed the planet in 2020, the fair question is, if a benevolent higher power exists, what's the problem here? Why is life on Earth not any better? Perhaps it's presumptuous to suggest an answer, and one hates to sound simplistic, but could the problem be that we simply haven't found a way to engage with that higher power if it does exist? Humanity can't seem to come to a collective agreement about who and what God is, what God wants, what God does, and how God does it. There's a huge irony here. Do you see the irony? Eight out of ten of us agree about a higher power that we can't agree about. We agree that it exists, but that's the beginning and the end of it. About everything else, we're all over the map. One religion declares this, one religion declares that, 
One culture says this, one culture says that, one person claims this, one person claims that. Do we listen to the priest, to the imam, to the rabbi, to the minister? Do we heed the words of the priestess, of the preacher, of the pastor, of the monk? Do we follow the example of the sister, of the brother, of the others in holy orders? Could it be that what each of them is so sure is true is all just wishful thinking and that there is no God? Or could what we say we know about God simply be inaccurate? This is what I have come to call the God dilemma. Does any of this matter? I think it does. In fact, I know it does. It matters because it's rendered us singularly incapable of bringing to bear the power of God we say we believe in as a means of building the world we say we want to live in. But now there's hope because enough people like you are asking enough questions like this. We have enough of a chance to turn enough of this around to make enough of life work at last we can produce an answer to this dilemma. We can embrace the God solution. Oh, and by the way, this is not what most people encountering those three words think that it is. Let's start by agreeing that what human beings believe about God and about life is important. Some people say that our ideas about all of this are nothing but mental exercises at best and that we need to get on with what really matters. That may sound all well and good, except that what really matters arises out of what we believe. Looking deeply at this reveals the following beliefs create behaviors. Behaviors Let me read that again. Looking deeply at this reveals the following. There's a colon. Beliefs create behaviors. Behaviors create experience. Experience creates reality. And the realities we've created out of our belief about God and about life do not paint a very pretty picture. We're talking about a species that permits... 1.7 billion of us members to go their entire lives without a drop of clean water. That seems not to be, that seems not to be bothered by the fact that 1.6 billion still do not have electricity. That looks the other way as 2.6 billion exist without indoor toilets. That allows over 650 of its children to die of starvation every hour. There has been armed conflict somewhere on this planet for 92% of recorded history. One member of our species commits suicide every 40 seconds. In 2017, just under 465,000 of us were murdered. And the numbers in these statistics, and you add the numbers in these statistics and you get a pretty good idea of how well our species is doing as a civilization. And if you think about our ideas about God have little to do with all of this, think again. 80% of civil law in most countries of Europe and the West is based on canon law. In other words, the teachings of religion. Then there are our day-to-day cultural behavior, the decisions and the choices we make. These two are based on our most sacred beliefs about who we are in relation to each other and about how life should work. The result? Even the people who are not a part of the statistics I've presented here are too often unhappy 
folks are struggling. Many are feeling unsettled and are experiencing turmoil in their day-to-day lives. Too many, in fact, for a society that calls itself an advanced civilization. Nobody wants it this way. Most humans deeply desire peace, security, opportunity, sufficiency, stability, and all the health, happiness, joy, and love we can jam into a lifetime. Yet we seem utterly unable to produce these outcomes on a consistent basis for any but the tiniest percentage of us. And it's not as if we just started trying last week. We've been trying for 50 millennia without success. Is anybody asking why? Or more to the point, why isn't anybody asking why? Perhaps we're afraid to question the basic beliefs that undergird our spiritual understandings. Or maybe we're afraid to have anyone hear us questioning those beliefs. Humanity's biggest dilemma relating to God is not whether people think there is or is not a God, but what those who think there is a God hold as their belief about God. If we really are an advanced civilization, as in capital A, capital C, why is truly, why is life on earth the way it is? And what if we are not as advanced as as we imagine we are? Is there anything, anything we could do to accelerate our progress as a species and as an individual member of that species? Yes. We could come up with one totally clear, overarching, and commonly held belief about the higher power. Such a belief could unite humanity within the framework of a single theological, philosophical, and emotional epic. And this could be extraordinarily powerful in ending our collectively dysfunctional and mutually self-destructive behaviors. Agreeing on a jointly embraced statement about God can't be that difficult. And it couldn't be more urgent given the direction in which our world is heading. What's interesting is that thousands of humans share thousands of commonly held beliefs about thousands of other things. We've come to conclusions on some of the biggest mysteries our tribe has encountered. Yet with all of our genius, all of our ingenuity, all of our intelligence, and in spite of all of our evolutionary advancement, we can't seem to come even close to producing a commonly held belief about the most important aspect of life of all. Is the truth about this really that unknowable? Is it accurate to say that mysterious are the ways of the Lord? I don't think so. We certainly experience them as unknowable, but that's not because it's impossible to know more about them. Rather, it's because we haven't sought to do so with our minds open rather than closed with our hearts connected rather than disconnected, with the voice of our souls amplified by a common desire rather than muffled by our collective fear of unacceptable and unallowable answers. The good news is that we have, after 50 millennia, finally reached the point in our evolution where we are just one step away from solving the God dilemma. The bad news is that the solution may require us to challenge and maybe even, hold your breath, change some of our most sacred beliefs, which we clung to for a long, long time. I wonder if you want me to stop. That's the end of the second chapter. I would think we should keep going, but that's me. Okay. 
Okay. Anybody else want to say something before we move on? You're on mute. Mary, you know, there you go. I was trying to unmute and I kept hitting the wrong button. I just want to say that those statistics were fairly mind blowing um, about the people who don't have water, about, you know, I mean, we know all of that, but it's why sometimes I say just just hot and cold running water on demand is like a freaking miracle that most of the world can't even comprehend and we take it for granted. But the other thing was that statistic that every 40 seconds, someone is like, stop the world, I wanna get off and kills themselves was just sort of mind blowing for me. That's all I wanted to say. It's like having that all there in black and white was powerful, over. Agreed. Yeah, I for those of you that don't know, I've been reading um, my book, Walking Through Your Walls. Um, I read it on Sundays, actually, uh, a couple hours after we finish. And right now I'm in a section, uh, it's called Paul's of History, it's the section of the book. And it goes through... Um, one of the things it does, it, it recaps many of the wars we've had and I forget where it is in this first session here but he made reference to um, how we've been at war with each other for like 92% of the time we're here or something yeah. um, and, and me because that book was more of a channel piece than my idea. It was not my idea to write all that stuff about history, but now I understand because it's the same point that Neil is making here. What we have to really wrap our heads around is that we don't get along, even though you know, here, here it is. It's on page, it's in chapter two on the bottom of the first page. An armed conflict somewhere on this planet for 92% of recorded history. And you, you know, when we poll each other and we say, what do you want? Everybody always says, we want peace. But how can we have lived for 92% of our time fighting with each other if, we want, if what we want is peace? And if what we came here to do was to create heaven on earth? Now, why are we having such a struggle? That remains the question, I guess. Well, yeah. And I was thinking about that while you were reading it a little bit. Like, does everybody really want the same thing? I would say that most do. But I would say that there are people who don't necessarily want peace because they're caught up in these conflict mentalities. Maybe that's what we have to change. But I was thinking about... Um, you know, just some of these conflicts that have been going on for a very long time, let's say, like in the Middle East, Israel and Palestine, most of those people want peace, but there are some people who I don't know if peace is what they actually want. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they do. And it's just the idea of how to get it is messed up. I think that the people that don't appear to want peace are the ones that are suffering their own demons, right? Their own self, lack of self-love or their own, you know, self-torture. I, 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 think, I think they're the people who fall into the category of hurt people hurting people. Because I think when you're not in pain yourself, I, I, I think... We're all the same that way. When we're not suffering, when we're, when we're balanced and whole in and of ourselves, we run towards the burning building, right? We don't run away. We don't stand and watch. We run towards it because we are bound by our humanity to help each other. That's our nature. 
And so if when asked, do you want peace? Or, or, you know, what's, what's the one thing that would make you happy? What's the one thing that you want in life? It, it is true that 99.9% of the people will answer that they want peace. And if there is someone that doesn't answer that way, I, I'm, I'm going to just assume that it's because they're in too much pain themselves. Should we go on? Nanette, I saw you were on the phone there for a second. Um, yeah, it was a personal call that I told I would return later. Um, I think that uh, to be in so much pain that you don't want peace, I can't imagine that because it seems to me that the more pain you were in, the more you'd want peace. So that's a confusing line of thought for me. Um, well, I, I, well, let me clarify. So it's, I, I say that specifically related to the notion that hurt people hurt people. And when, when, when a person is in a certain amount of pain, a certain kind of pain, the only thing that will make them feel better is the idea that somebody else is in the same amount of pain. Yeah, and I guess because of the fact that we've read so many books, all of us combined, untold numbers, that's, I don't think that's the way any of us think. And so it's a real hard pill to swallow. Right. 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 But it's important. See, this is, so, so this is the idea of being in an echo chamber, right? If all we ever do is hang out with people that are spiritually advanced and studying and working on um, spiritual growth, then we may not see that kind of suffering. We may not see that kind. We saw that on January 6th, right? January 6th was a, a broadcast display of people in pain, people who perceive themselves to be in some form of suffering, some form of, you know, unhappiness. And they were going to cause a lot of unhappiness for a lot of other people to fix their unhappiness. That's what was being acted out. And if we, if we stay in our groups like this, then we're in an echo chamber and we don't realize that stuff's out there. And I think to a great extent, I think what religious people saw, what religious leaders saw on January 6th was a sign that they have not been tending to their flock You know, it should have been a huge wake-up call for everybody that there's that much pain and confusion, right? Confusion about what's real. What is reality? What is truth? And Neil starts that out with, you know, in the book. What is, is, is God real or isn't he real? So it's like we're fighting about all these things. And I don't know, maybe this is the right time to bring this up. There's actually, uh, there's actually a teacher uh, out there in the Course in Miracles world that's apparently teaching people that God doesn't know about us. So now you have a whole nother, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah. somebody, somebody asked me about that yesterday and I was like, I'm, I'm not aware of that, but they, they actually found the teacher's name that, that's saying it. So there's, there's so, so much, much disagreement. Oh, hang on. I 
I accidentally bumped something on my computer and unmuted my laptop so we were getting feedback. Well, shall we go on? Yeah. Uh, yes, I think so. Unless, I mean, if somebody else has got a comment or a question, I'm... I do, yeah, yeah. I, I, please go. Mrs. Paquette, you've absolutely piqued my person, my, my curiosity. Like, I didn't know God didn't know about me. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> what a concept. <laughs> I, I thought he believed in me. I think he does. Right. I think he, she does. Yeah, but who is this person? I'm dying to meet them. I mean, I'm eager to meet them. I don't want to die at all. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> who is this person? I'm, I'm curious. Uh, okay. There's a website called the Circle of Atonement where she found an article written by a Robert Perry. He writes, quote, for a great many course students, it has become a fundamental principle of the course that God does not know where we are here and does not even know we think we are here. What's that in that book? It's an article. No, it's a website. She uh -oh. says it's a website. The website's called The Circle of Atonement. And the article is written by a guy by the name of Robert Perry. Okay, so now, Linda, I'm just holding my breath until we get to the meditation so I can tell Robert Perry that... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's what I want to say about that. It just proves... So, like, I was an economics major in college, and we had to take statistics and one of the interesting things I learned was how you can basically manipulate statistics to show whatever you want them to show and people do that with the Bible all the time right they pick they cherry pick the passages to show what they want it to say so you know clearly a course in miracles must have that same characteristic where you can kind of use it to say whatever you want it to say. I've never really studied it. I've only read a book of quotes that sort of resonated with me and listened to Linda read some of it until I gave up on it. <laughs> but it's that Well, I think it can happen have. in everything, right? Yeah, it's that you It can happen in have. everything. We can it's what's that called like a bias confirmation or something like that. Right. right. Anyway, that's Well, and that happened it. on Saturday. Or yeah. maybe, maybe it was Friday, I guess. So the whole defense, <laughs> you know, they just took a bunch of things out of context, you know, and they put this whole video together, but all of the quotes were out of context. Of course. You know, so it's the yeah. same idea. And that's why my answer to everybody, whether it's something I've said or something I'm reading somebody else said or whatever, is you take it in, you take it into you, and how does it feel? Yeah. And that's how you can tell whether it's true or not. It'll either feel true or it won't. And so if it feels true, it's true for you. Well, I mean, the only reason I believe in God is because he believes in me. It believes in me. I mean, otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Right. None of it made any sense to me. I mean, why would we bother praying? Why, do you, why would you pray? <laughs> if God doesn't know about us, why would you pray? Who are you praying to then? Also, like, what's their concept of God? I don't understand this God who doesn't know. Like, that right there. Right. It's like... <laughs> right, right. But it would be interesting to have a discussion, right? How would we have a discussion without alienating somebody with that belief? Now it occurs to me that other thing where like in the Bible it said God makes us in his image and then I had my aha moment where I was like no we make God in our image right 
so maybe this is another example of that, you know. Right. Beware of those, it's a poem, beware of false gods created by like scared tiny people. So, anyway. <laughs> Well, I'm just wondering why Anne Darby hasn't been unhelpful today. <laughs> I guess she's gone. No, she's there. No. Oh, there you are. I've got no, nothing, nothing to say, Shabana, really, apart from e e economics, I suppose. And there's Mary, and she's the economics person. Uh, that it, you know the economy is built on arms and drugs and that's how I see it. So of course they create conflict in order to sell the arms to create the disruption. Right. But, but so what I'm for myself, I think to be kind. So this is my latest thing. What bothers me that <laughs> I need kindness. So rather than peace, I need kindness. I'm needing kindness, loving kindness. Yes, yes. And if we could do that for each other, that that's a nice that's that's a that's a that's a a way, isn't it? A new way, maybe. Yeah. Instead of fighting each other, just the loving kindness. Well, that I like that. Very yeah, that yes. took care of my meditation. I won't even worry about <laughs> God in me. Thank you, Anne. But you have to be more unhelpful. One of okay. my math says be kind. <clears throat> and I always get comments from service workers on that one. You know, they're like, thank you for your math. And mm -hmm. the other thing I wanted to say was I thought about you, Anne, because you know, you're throwing judgment in the rubbish bin. I thought about that because because I was thinking about like, I have a lot of, historically, I've had a lot of resistance to a lot of stuff, which right there is judgment. You know, you can't resist something unless you're judging it as unwanted. Mm. And, um, and so I was thinking about how to reframe frame that for myself and in the past I've tried acceptance and that one doesn't work very well but the one I came up with this week was allowance like just mm -hmm. allow it you know mm -hmm. so like the same thing with those people who I don't understand and want to judge you know just allow them to be who they are allow mm -hmm. me to be who I mm -hmm. am allow mm -hmm. life to be what life is mm -hmm. So mm. that's where I thought about you and your unhelpful comments this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> I love that, Mary. And it ties in with something that Matt Kahn was teaching the other day as well. Um, he was teaching about the word gratitude and how a lot of spiritual people, when they, when they, think they, you know, when we hear that we should be grateful, mm -hmm. that there's a confusion that means we, we, by saying I'm grateful for something that we are saying we like it, or that we invite it into our world, or that we, you know, want it. And, and so gratitude, that word gratitude can kind of have some baggage with it as well. Mm -hmm. And um, his suggestion was to uh, replace the word with appreciate because you can appreciate something showing up without it or, or allow it. And I, I like allow it too. It doesn't mean you like it, but you can still be grateful for it being there for whatever lesson it's bringing or for whatever the next thing that comes after it is. It doesn't mean we like it just because we're grateful for it. I think it's a good distinction.
I think, um, can I say something? I think it doesn't matter whether we like it or we don't like it. It doesn't matter. It, uh, just, it's here anyway. Yeah, right. It's exactly. here anyway. <laughs> here it is. Exactly. You yeah, know. Exactly. exactly. Um, and then see what, how we can navigate our boat, I suppose, the boat of our life in the nicest, kindest way. Yeah. Right. Considering right. our connectedness to everyone and everything and all of life. That way. That's yeah. I yep. I also saw something about the difference between nice and kind and how you can be kind without being nice and you can be nice without being kind. How kind is more comes from the heart and it's helpful and nice can be more surface level politeness. So like mm -hmm. the example they used was, you know, a, it was a New York example and I don't remember it, but it's like, you know, it's raining and the guy will be like, you know, shove an umbrella in your hand, but he's not at all nice or polite about it. <laughs> Versus somewhere <laughs> else they might say, oh, I'm so sorry, you're getting wet, but they don't give you the, the umbrella, right? So. Mm -hmm. Kindness, kindness. I like that you use that word and I associate it with you. You seem like a very kind person to me. And I appreciate that about you. And kindness seems to be an action. Yeah. Where niceness yeah. seems to be a platitude. Right. And um, because I mean, I mean, I, I don't mind being thought of as a nice person, right? but I would rather be thought of as a kind person. Right. Over. Um, I think we're talking about beingness. Um, so for myself, the only thing that I'm interested in being is accepting of myself because once i don't look bad no one looks bad so the judgment is dissolved hmm. so that's, <laughs> but that's 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 what neil's talking about i think is beingness yes so the dalai lama talks about his religion is kindness and, uh, you know, I'm figuring that that's what Anne Darby really is, is Buddhist. <laughs> I laughed because when you said once, once I don't look bad to me, then other people don't look bad to me. And of course, I thought of our former president because he's one of my greatest spiritual challenges. Maybe that's why he exists just to force me to go deeper. <laughs> I have to say, I was, I'm, this is not the right group, it's a Tuesday thing, but I was pleasantly surprised that seven Republican senators voted to convict. Sorry to bring this up, but I think that the positive intentions of one of our Tuesday group people is how we ended up with a whole seven. I was surprised by that. Anyway, sorry, over, I'm done being in a, like, Back to Neil and being this and everything. <laughs> Just going back to gratitude, um, I, I was really grateful for an opportunity that came up a couple of weeks ago. I think that's maybe why I wasn't here, because I crashed my car into um, in, on black ice, basically. And I went zooming down the hill. Oh, out of control, which lots of people do here. And I went into a concrete, or not concrete, and actually a granite wall of somebody's house. And the amount of things that came out of that, or the people that came out of their houses, the person whose house it was who said, it's okay, I was gonna mend that gutter anyway, you don't have to do anything. And then another one who wanted to take me down the road. And then everyone who hadn't spoken to each other in lockdown came out and put grit on the ground the actual ricochet effect of it in terms of kindness was just amazing 
I thought it was worth having that accident <laughs> for the kindness yeah. that came out of it. Because people were looking for some opportunity to be kind because they weren't allowed to connect. Right. Mm. I'm, I'm so glad that you are okay and everything turned out okay. Yeah. It's, but I think so people want to be kind and yes. they had been locked indoors and not had an opportunity so they all came out at once. <laughs> And you provide yeah, see, that opportunity for all those people. It's beautiful. Yeah, Good right. job. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, shall we go ahead and read for a few more minutes? Sure. Okay. Yeah, this is a short chapter. It's just two pages. So that's chapter three. Changing beliefs is not something that human beings do easily or quickly. It took the Catholic Church 359 years to admit that Galileo was right when he dared to propose that our planet was not the center of the universe as the church taught and to revert to its excommunication of him. But humanity finally comes, came to its senses. It took the medical profession over a half a century to admit that Hungarian physician Ignaz Semmelweis was right in 1847 when he declared, when he dared to propose that if doctors sterilized their hands with disinfectant before going from one medical procedure to the next, patient infections and infant mortalities would be greatly reduced, and that we need to reverse our blindness to the existence of germs. But humanity finally came to its senses. The amazing work that's been done in mapping the human genome would not have been possible were it not for Barbara McClintock, whose work as a geneticist was initially unaccepted by the scientific community, which told her that her discovery of the existence of jumping genes Sequences of DNA that are moved between genomes with nothing more than junk DNA. In 1983, she was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize as the significance of her work was recognized. Humanity came to its senses after realizing that she had been right about what everyone said she was wrong about. The list could go on, this naming of who had it wrong and who we eventually honored as those who have it right. I've come up with my own way of describing the people in this list. I call them idea heroes. The dictionary defines heroism as great bravery. And I think it takes great bravery to make a public pronouncement of something about which one knows ahead of time, thousands, perhaps hundreds, perhaps thousands, or maybe even millions will disagree. It's thanks to idea heroes that most of us finally agree that germs exist, that jumping genes exist, and that a great many of other things we once did not believe to be true are, as it turns out, true as can be. But what is true about God? Ah, uh, back to the dilemma again. The challenge in reaching consensus here is that there's more than one question on the table. And this is what has created such difficulty for our species in coming to a collective agreement. There's not only the question of whether there is a higher power, but if it does exist, what that higher power consists of, what is its essential nature, what are its attributes, its defining properties, its characteristics. What is its desire? Does it even have desires? What is its usefulness? Can it even be used? What do you think? Two more pages? I think so. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, 
page, this is chapter four, will asking questions about God one more time do nothing but invite more intellectual excursions that in the end take us to exactly where we are right now? Will we still be a world divided and undecided about a higher power and about just about everything else? The answer is yes, if we're going to allow ourselves to be satisfied with the same answers we've come up with before. But what if we came up with different answers, daring answers? And what if we invited ourselves to do that deliberately? This is precisely how science has produced amazing discoveries. This is how medicine has produced miraculous cures. This is how technology has produced incredible inventions. Is there a reason we have decided this is a sin, perhaps the highest offense when it comes to theology? The word theology is defined as the study of God, not as the one and only firm and final truth about God. So we would do well to study this further. Why did people call in religious communities? But why did certain people in religious communities become theologians if they felt there was no more to know or to explain about God? We notice that people such as Francis of Assisi, Catherine of Siena, Thomas Aquinas, Martin Berber, Hildegard of uh, Bingen, Ibn Arabi, Arabi uh, Julian of Norwich, Judith Paslow, African theologians, um, Bolaji Idu, uh, John Matibi, and Kiwi Dixon, and many others of many traditions have felt that there was more to study and more to say about God. What if we became theologians and began our own deep look to see if there could be an as yet not widely held understanding of the term higher power? What if this could clarify everything? Is humanity even available to such a possibility? Or are we so close-minded that even a suggestion that we permit an exploration of the highest truth to venture outside the boundary of the orthodox is not to be tolerated? Is this what we've come to? I'm going to suggest that this is not who we are, but that the limitations we've placed on our thinking have produced an aberration. I propose that coming up with a single overarching understanding about God could be the best thing that humanity ever did for itself. And for those today who believe in a higher power, for those today do not believe in a higher power, and for those who on this day aren't sure one way or the other, I predict that the benefit would be equal. But what we need now are some idea heroes. Might you be one of them? Idea heroes are not just those who come up with revolutionary and in some places totally unacceptable ideas, but also those who are willing to listen to new ideas from others and explore them fully. Idea heroes have the bravery to allow some of their preconceived notions to be challenged, especially along long-standing ideas about God and life and about each other. Idea heroes possess the courage to cross the border of the uh, certainties to explore territories of possibilities. I think it's important, very important for us to do that today. Why? Because if there is a higher power and we're simply not using it effectively, wouldn't that be a shame? Wouldn't it be a terrible waste? stop there a long long time ago like in the sixth grade and i'm old we saw a film it was a fascinating film and one of the things that film said that i've always remembered to this day was radical ideas threaten institutions then become institutions themselves which are in turn threatened by radical ideas and maybe that's one of the reasons why i've carried a pretty open mind with me. <laughs> I think it was for science class. 
it was a great film. Anyway, it's like, you know, seeing the, the process of how that works, right? How beautiful. That's that's the story of evolution. Mm. Thank you for turning your noise off. <laughs> hmm. Well, I don't know about you all, but I'm enjoying this so far. And um, given that we're at the end of the hour, perhaps Miss Shibana has a meditation for us. Lord God, we thank you that each one of us here is an ideas hero, starting with Mary, who has summarized the whole business of evolution. Thank you for her memory of this grade six film, which has now uplifted all six of us. And we thank you that Nanette is an ideas hero in her determination to be kind in every circumstance, particularly now when she's settling in to a new home and a new life. Thank you for Nanette's courage. We thank you for Sarah Summerson's quick assessment of how blessed everyone was that her accident gave so many people the opportunity to express what is most godly in their heart and that is the desire to help and to nurture each other. Thank you for Sarah's understanding that this blessing was greater than most because it had such a huge ripple effect. We thank you that Anne Darby knows as an ideas hero, that the only thing which matters is kindness. And we're grateful that Anne's comments every week shed so much light on our discussion. We wish Anne continued helpfulness. And we thank you, God, that Linda continues to read with sincerity and the ability to connect disparate elements. Her view, Linda's view, that everyone who stormed the Capitol building on January 6th was crying out for help. That is huge. The changed perspective gives us the opportunity to feed those who have their mouths open, desperately seeking the God solution. So I'm the ideas hero in inviting everyone here to lift up humanity and Gaia in receiving the God solution, which is essentially love, 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 and more love because loving ourselves and loving each other is the one way of not just mending ourselves, but of feeding each other. 
and the world and, 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 and the earth, Gaia. So we thank you that we can do this here now. Amen. I'm reminded of the Bruce Springsteen song, Everybody Has a Hungry Heart. And Mary was holding the God solution in such a way that we could clearly see the red heart there. And it's Valentine's Day. So we're grateful that like Jesus telling Peter to feed his sheep, we in turn are feeding all those who are, whose hearts are crying out for love. The love we're providing from our hearts to theirs is what's feeding everyone now. Amen. Oh my goodness, I just remembered that Jesus first asked Peter three times, do you love me? And when Peter got exasperated, Jesus said, feed my sheep. So that's what Linda was saying, is that all these folks with their guns and threats and fury just wanted to be fed love. Thank you, Linda, for making that so clear. Thank you, yeah. everyone. Thank you, Linda, for reading, and thank you, everybody, for your input today. I think this book is going to prove to be an interesting conversation piece um, just by what happened today. So, and thank you, Shabana for your very thoughtful words. You always manage to do that, and I don't know how you do it. <laughs> but you do. So. Is, it, is it wrong, Ben, when you said something about their open mouths and we need to feed them love? I laugh because I saw like little baby birds and you're just cramming it in there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. We will see each other next week. And um, and Darby, I hope it warms up where you are. Because you look cold. I know. Thank you. I have, uh, you know, um, problems, um, financial problems to pay for it. So I'm lasting out for a bit longer until I put the heating on. Oh, <laughs> oh my. I'm sending you warm thoughts. Thank you. I'm sending you, I'm sending you money thoughts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're all welcome. <laughs> all righty. Okay, I love you all. We'll see each other next week. Love you all. Love you all. Love you too, Nanette. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Lots of love. Much love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.